And we are live. What's up, guys? Welcome to FEDA. Today, we're going to be covering a part of the Mafia series. We're going to be covering the Genovese crime family. Uh, I got Andrew here with me. Hi, guys. Um, I'm, I'll be here. I, I know I was, like, I was not on the last live, well, premiere. The for... last Mafia episode. The last Mafia episode, yes. Yeah. I was busy sleeping. She was asleep, guys. She, yeah. she, she's useless. No, I'm just kidding. No, she actually, uh, she helped out. And she was really tired because you guys got to remember that she works another job. So. She works a full day, then she comes and helps me with Fed it. Um, after and then I finish my shift. After yeah. she finishes like eight, ten hours of work. And then on top of that, we had done uh which episode did we we did the sni DC sniper. Yeah, the which DC, was very long. The DC sniper. Without, then uh, after that, right, we go get food and stuff like that. By then it's like three, four o'clock. I mean, hell, right now as we're filming, it's four thirty in the morning. Um yeah. and that day Myron slept all day. That's why he wasn't a star. <laughs> I will not confirm or deny if that is true. <laughs> But yeah, so she she went to sleep. That's why, like, you know what I mean. So she she comes out and helps me out at the end of her long work shift. So shout out to her. Right. Uh, but anyway, so guys, we're gonna get right into. I'm not even gonna play the intro here. We're gonna go ahead and go right into the Genovese crime family. Um, so the Genovese crime family, pronounced uh, Genovese, I think, also sometimes referred to as the West Side, is an Italian American mafia uh, crime family and one of the five families that dominate organized crime activities in New York City and New York, New Jersey, as part of the American Mafia, they have generally maintained a varying degree of influence over many of the smaller mob families outside of New York, including ties with the Philadelphia Patriarcha and Buffalo crime families. Okay. Okay. Um, hang on, yeah. Mar um, before you guys go any further, I just want you to know that if you're watching this, this is the fourth uh, out of the five families ah, that we've yes. covered already. Good call. So um, if you haven't watched any of the other ones, go watch it before you watch this one. Although yes. it's not going to like um, make much of a difference, but it is very important that you watch the first episode that we At made. least the first one. Yes. We, so can, we can kill you. Be like... And you know what? I'm really glad you mentioned that. Let me share the screen with them real quick so they see what we're talking about here. And, and stuff. Yeah, okay, so guys, cool. we went ahead and created a whole uh, mafia playlist. playlist for you guys right here. Okay, and the, this Genovese one is going to be here. But as you guys can see, the first episode we covered was, um, and I'll enlarge it for you guys real fast, uh, was, you know, the origins, right, where we break down, <clears throat> to, to, to chat you know, everything. Talk. Oh, shout out to Michael Francis. We're going to actually have him on yeah. the podcast next week. Yes. On the Fresh of Fit. So, I'm uh, so excited. Yeah, it's going to be great. Um, Angie's been researching uh, uh, been questions to ask, his, his history, yeah. everything like that. She's pretty much been uh, covering that. Um, so, yeah, we got Michael Francis. Oh, sorry. Uh, we, the origins here, right? Then we go ahead and go into John Guy and the Gambino family. Then we got the Lucchese's, how they were freaking, man, those guys made money by any means. They were extorting um, kosher chicken spots. Yeah. Yeah, they didn't give a shit. And then the Bonanno crime family. This is the one that Angie missed. Uh, yeah, yeah. Guy. But yeah, like I said, she was passed out. But you did, didn't you watch this on the premiere with them? I tried watched, to kill me. So, yeah, yeah, I was oh. part of the premiere. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm always watching the premieres with you guys. And I'm always like, I'm active at um, the chat so I can copy like your case requests and all that stuff yeah. so i'll be i'll be watching this premiere for sure so yeah that's why i wanted to mention if you guys are watching this um this is the fourth of the five families so the last one we left it uh at last uh, on purpose because we're gonna have the mr Francesi. yes yes Francesi we will have him on we'll have may him on. 17 yes so that's why we left that's him why we're yeah last. the colombo one we we're gonna colombo do the colombo family. one first but we pushed it back just uh since he's gonna be in town um but uh but yeah guys so go check out that mafia playlist man you guys have been asking for the mafia forever so we're we're delivering as you guys wanted and then probably after this we'll probably cover some colombian uh crime stuff and then some mexican stuff so like i said before as you guys know when it comes to um organized crime groups i want to make sure that i have entire series i mean hell we got a whole 911 playlist mm -hmm. which we're going to do the second part of 911 by the way guys um on rumble that's definitely not going to be on youtube for obvious you know. reasons because of them boys if you know what i'm saying actually um, Marianne, i wanted to ask you like after yeah. we finish this is the question that i wanted to ask like yeah. after we finish the this like five families of the italian mafia what we, sh we should do like uh, are we continuing with the italian mafia uh we'll like probably you know, do um informants and stuff good good question what we'll probably do two two things we're gonna do so al capone because I know they've been asking okay, you about yes, that, right? They have. So we're going to yes, cover Al Capone and the outfit out of Chicago. Because they didn't call them the mafia in Chicago. They called them the outfit. So we're going to definitely cover that at least. Then we might, I might go ahead and do uh, the Philly mob and the Buffalo mob and uh, the Florida guys uh, down there in Tampa. Like, um, uh, I think Traficante. 
like I might do all them in one episode, right? So all the other kind of like mob mob guys in all the different parts of the country, I might cover that in like one episode. So we're gonna do Al Capone dedicated with the outfit in Chicago because that was like the next big uh, mafia organization. Then we're gonna go ahead and cover all the smaller sub subsets in the different parts, and then I'm gonna go ahead and do an episode. And this is gonna be a special for y'all. I'll announce it right now. We're gonna have Ryan Dawson on, and we're gonna cover how the Italian mafia and organized crime work very closely with the CIA guys. And they definitely worked with intelligence agencies back in the days, especially in the forties, et cetera, because just watch the documentary New Mech, and you guys are going to see how intelligence agencies played a role in criminal activity going on and maybe some nuclear bombs being transported to a certain country that we can not talk about on YouTube. So yeah. Anyway, uh, but yeah, I'll do an episode with Ryan Dawson on that mm-hmm. as well, guys. Okay. So cool. um, anyway, without further ado, guys, we're gonna go ahead and break down this episode, the Crazy Don. Okay, from the FBI files. As y'all know, I love this documentary because it, you know, it takes a more specific look at um, the FBI agents that are involved in the investigations, and the FBI agents give a lot more background on the cases, which I like, which gives a lot more in my opinion, richer information for you guys and more for me to break down for as well because I can kind of read between the lines when they give their um, background on the cases. So yeah, without further ado, let's get into it. For 30 years, Vincent Giganti wandered the streets of New York's Greenwich Village, dressed in a tattered bathrobe and babbling endlessly to himself. To the FBI, he was believed to be the boss of New York's most powerful mafia organization, the Genovese crime family. Was Giganti crazy, or was his behavior a shrewd attempt to disguise his position as a ruthless mafia boss? That question would take years to answer. Yeah, you guys heard that right. You had a guy who basically was supposed to be crazy to evade detection from the FBI, man. So that is creative. Every family has eccentrics, even crime families. Crime boss Vincent Giganti, head of New York's Genovese family, was undoubtedly eccentric. The question remained, was he truly mad? Justice rested on the answer. Outwardly, he roamed the streets as a doggedly old man, barely in touch with reality. But in the eyes of the law, he was a cunning conspirator and responsible for murder. I'm Jim Kallstrom former director of the FBI's New York office. Organized crime takes a concerted effort to crack. The FBI is devoted to cracking it. The case against Giganti hinged on his ability to stand trial. Was his strange behavior an act of madness or a stroke of genius? Anyone who witnessed Giganti's ravings would have found it hard to believe that he controlled the largest and most profitable family in the New York Mafia an organization with a long and bloody history. The origins of the mafia. Can- so I will say this. One good thing that this documentary does is it's going to go ahead and go over the origins of the mafia and give you guys a quick little, you know, rewind. But if you guys want the full background on, you know, everything from Sicily to the Castamillaris War, Lucky Luciano, Maranzano, all that stuff, um, how the mafia became to be, the commission, all that stuff, I go into way more detail on that first episode that I showed you guys on the Mafia playlist. Be traced back to 13th century feudal Sicilian society. Bands of Sicilian families organized themselves to rebel against the oppressive and ruthless French invaders. Mafia, the acronym for the Italian Morta alla Francia Italia Anella, which translates to death to the French as Italy's cry became the name that these organized families used to refer to themselves. It's meaning synonymous with men of honor. By the 19th century, the Mafia re-emerged in Sicily as a purely criminal culture, mostly hiring themselves out to wealthy landowners to oppress upstart peasants. More and more, the goal of the Mafia became focused on how to generate illegal profits. The tradition continued as waves of Italians emigrated to New York in the 1920s. Most immigrants lived in cramped and poor conditions. As a result of growing ethnic tensions, Sicilian Americans became the target of growing resentment. 
they needed mafia protection more and more. Louis Schillero, a third generation Italian American, is head of the FBI's New York field office. A 23 year veteran, he is an expert on the mafia. Translation when they say head of the New York field office, guys, that means he is the special agent in charge, uh, which the FBI refers to that as a SAIC. Uh, when I worked at HSI, we used to call them an SAC or a SAC. Um, but, uh, you know, the bureau uses different acronyms every now and then. But yeah, he's pretty much uh, the top guy um, in New York, which if you go to New York field office, um, they're going to have multiple SAICs, actually, that oversee multiple groups because it's such a big field office. And its intricate structure. When they first became uh, prevalent in New York City, it, it primarily uh, victimized members of the immigrant community, where in, in, in lower Manhattan, they became the victims of extortions and protection rackets. And, and that's how the, the Cousin Nostra families originally got their start. With prohibition, influence of the crime families grew out from the isolated neighborhoods and began to spread nationwide. A new form of underworld cooperation emerged. Various crime families across America banded together to supply illegal alcohol to a country willing to pay for it. I think that probably more. As you guys know, the prohibition area is what made the mafia extremely wealthy in the 1920s. Uh, everyone wanted booze. They couldn't get it. So obviously the bootleggers had it. And who ran that? The, uh, the Italian mafia, man. More than anything. They were making billions of dollars in today's dollars equ equivalency. Gave the Italian gangs, the Italian Cosa Nostra families, a foothold in American society. Uh, not only from an organizational standpoint, but certainly from a financial base. Uh, since prohibition, uh, certainly they then expanded into other areas. Operating outside the law meant the mafia had to police itself. For an organization animated by self-interest and greed, there would always be conflict and opposition. An elite group of killers were organized to enforce mafia rules. Their oh yeah, that was back in the day. They didn't care. They were bombing up places. They were just shooting them with machine guns, man. It was, it was a different time back then by ensuring its survival. This group of mob and forces came to be known as Murder, Inc. By the early 1940s, Murder, Inc. would be responsible for hundreds of mob-related murders nationwide. The powerful New York bosses during the Mafia's early... That's Lucky Luciano right there, guys, often um, credited as being the godfather of the Mafia because he was... After the Castamilari's War, he basically um, instilled the ideology of the five crime families having their own bosses and the commission, which the commission would oversee the five crime families. And basically every boss would have a seat at the table at the commission. So they would make, um, they'd, you know, resolve disputes. They'd make uh, business decisions together. They would, you know, if a boss needed to get whacked or something like that, they would take a vote. So anything that was big, that needed be, to be done, uh, especially as far as like, you know, being an intermediary between the families, it was done through the commission, which was a nationwide effort, by the way, as seen by a Buffalo State Trooper who stumbled upon some of them in upstate New York. Years, Lucky Luciano and Frank Costello set up a ruling body for the mafia, responsible for delegating territories and duties among the various gangs nationwide. Home for America's five largest families, New York remained the center of the Mafia's expanding foothold in America. It remains so to this day. The five New York families consist currently of the Gambino family, the Bonanno, the Lucchese, uh, the Colombo, and the Genovese family. Uh, each of those families uh, are, are also members of the Commission and also have their base in New York City. The Commission, composed of the bosses... That's Carlo Gambino right there. As you guys uh, remember, we covered him. Mm -hmm. uh in the first ep uh, the second episode of the mafia series uh probably one of the most feared and um ra ruled with the most respected mob boss uh he ran for one of the longest amounts of time and on top of that he was never he never died of prison or was killed he actually died of natural causes which is yeah. rare for a mob boss of the five new york and he didn't live too far from where i grew up god damn it <laughs> in brooklyn <laughs> families Acts as a if y'all want to see where I grew up as a kid, you guys got to go back and watch the episode on the Gambino family, okay? Criminal board of directors, settling disputes between families and making major decisions on mafia business. Each family is governed by its administration, 
comprised of the boss, the underboss, and the consigliere or counselor, who are responsible for directing their family's criminal activity. Below the administration in the family hierarchy are the captains. The captains are the leaders of crews of soldiers, the men responsible for carrying out the day-to-day -day criminal activity. To become a soldier, properly known as a wise guy or good fella, an individual has to first be made or officially inducted into the secret society. He must blindly obey the rules of Cosa Nostra, Italian for this thing of ours. He is sworn to put the family ahead of all else. If he is asked to kill, he must faithfully do so. It was against this backdrop, a bustling immigrant community with an experience. And just so you guys know, I go over the ritual of how to become a made guy, um, what it takes, etc., all the requirements in the first episode when I talk mm -hmm. about, you know, the mafia in detail. Um, also, just so you guys know, uh, Captain is also known as a capo. That is pretty much like a first-line supervisor over a soldier who's a made guy. Capo Reimi. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Expanding Cosa Nostra influence that Vincent Giganti grew up. His parents came from Naples and settled in Lower Manhattan. Vincent finished eighth grade and started trade school, but soon dropped out. Less than a decade later, Giganti became a wise guy in the Genovese crime family. Vincent Giganti's crime. So that means he became a made guy. And by the way, I talk about this, guys, in the last episode that I did with, um, with the Bonanno crime family, how uh, Joe Pistone, undercover FBI agent, a.k.a. Donnie Brasco, almost became a made guy uh, while undercover came the closest to anyone ever to becoming a made guy that was in law enforcement. And you guys can see here all the crimes that um, <laughs> the mafia was involved in, you know, organized crime. You see all the tentacles, narcotics, extortion, murder, arson, bribery, hijacking, corruption, because they were hijacking uh, planes back then and stealing from them at the airport. If you guys remember, yeah. uh, the Gambino family did this. And John Gotti was notorious for this uh, labor racketeering, stolen property, Cigarette smuggling, which was a big thing back in the day, guys. You guys got to remember that back. Um, and you guys should watch my Hezbollah episode as well. If you guys really want to learn about cigarette smuggling. Yeah. Cigarette smuggling is one of those crimes that no one really gives a shit about it. But it's extremely profitable because mm -hmm. if you buy cigarettes in one area that's cheap or no taxes, etc. And you go sell them somewhere else, you can make quite a bit of money. And keep in mind, guys, 10, 20, 30 years ago, right? And plus, smoking was cool. It's not the same way as it is now in 2023 where smoking is considered like, dude, what are you doing? Like smoking cigarettes used to be the thing to do. You could leave the United States and everyone smokes, guys. So this whole not smoking thing is relatively new and an American thing. So back in the day, it used to be huge cigarette smuggling. And you'd be able to get away with it because no one gave a shit about it. The only people that really investigated it was like the ATF, if that. And uh, in the time, if you did get caught, was very little. And then you got infiltration of legitimate business. That's true because what was the mafia doing? They were uh, in entering in and strong arming um, labor unions, uh, you, the kosher, uh, the kosher chicken business, as you guys saw with the uh, Lucchese crime family, mm -hmm. uh, loan sharking, which is the process of you know it, um, basically giving people predatory loans. Hey, I'll give you this um, loan on twenty eight percent. Uh, or 29% or 30%, 40%, 50%, and then they can't pay you back. So next thing you know, now you say, okay, use work for me now. Forget about it. I own your business. And then obviously illegal gambling, that's the mafia's big one. Pornography, huge. Prostitution. Narcotics. Prostitution. Yeah, yeah. Even if they're not involved in it, what the mafia would do is, if you were conducting business where you were selling pornography or whatever, They'd come in and say, hey, you owe me a cut now or else forget about it. And then next thing you know, you're being extorted and they're just like, mama mia. They got a pay up or they're going to get some broken kneecaps. Career spanned a turbulent time in American mafia history. The mob had expanded its reach into legitimate businesses, the various families fighting to control. And in the ensuing turf wars, violence was often the final arbiter. The family that Giganti attached himself to was steeped in Cosa Nostra's American origins. The infamous Charles Lucky Luciano, responsible for organizing and structuring the American Mafia, was the family's first boss until he was imprisoned in 1936. As a result, Luciano's family administration, Frank Costello, nicknamed the Prime Minister of the Underworld, and Vito Genovese, fought for control of the family. 
Costello won out, but Vito Genovese began plotting his takeover. If you guys want to learn more about Lucky Luciano, watch that first episode that we did, and you guys are going to see how close he was to a certain individual, Mayor Lansky, a.k.a. one of them boys, and how he was critical to the Italian mafia's rise and making a lot of money. A young Vincent Giganti first gained notoriety as a mobster in 1957 when he attempted to murder Frank Costello. Within the Mafia, it was widely believed that Vito Genovese had ordered the hit to get rid of his rival. Giganti's bullet only grazed Costello's head, but apparently Costello got the message. Soon after the shooting, he put out word that he was retiring. Vito Genovese was now the boss of the family that would take his name. Giganti was arrested for attempted murder and brought to trial, but the case was dismissed for lack of a witness. The location and angle of Costello's wound indicated he probably saw the would-be assassin, but at the trial, he failed to identify Giganti as the shooter. Even for an ousted boss, the oath of secrecy remained sacred. Giganti continued to make money for the Genovese family through illegal enterprises. Two years after the failed assassination attempt, he was arrested and convicted of narcotics violations. He received a seven-year sentence. Convic and you guys, as you guys know, narcotics was something that was frowned upon in the mafia. But, you know, if you were an earner, they'd kind of look the other way. But typically, it was an offense that would get you killed. Convicted mobsters are expected to do their time and remain silent. If Giganti served his time and kept his mouth shut, he would be rewarded after his release. It was up to Giganti to figure out how to avoid future arrests. He was a model prisoner, neat, polite, and willing to take on any job. Giganti's cooperation was so impressive that some prison officials wrote glowing reports. He was released early from the federal penitentiary in Lewisburg for good behavior when he was 35 years old. Oh, gotcha, bitch. Now he's about to be back out there on the streets. Giganti now devised a secret plan that he hoped would prevent his return to prison forever. He didn't want to leave his mafia life or give up his shot at becoming the boss of the family. After his release in 1964, Giganti's public behavior began to grow bizarre. He became a frequent sight on the streets of Greenwich Village. Giganti could be found wandering the neighborhood, appearing disoriented and mentally unstable. Sounds crazy. He was like, I'm not going back. <laughs> I'm not going back. Forget about you know, it. was crazy. Um, the, 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 the Italian mafia bought like, a lot of people in prison. So they would like whenever a member of the mafia will go to prison, they will be treated with respect yes. at all times. Yes, we saw that in the uh, Bonanno family. Uh, one of the guys, the boss that was in the uh, in jail, he basically called the black people Mrah! the N word. If y'all know what I'm saying, I'm on YouTube. I can't say if I was on Rumble, I would, but uh, and uh, <laughs> you would say that yeah, too and, much. Yeah, I, but anyway, yeah. <laughs> so he would he would say that, and they didn't touch him. Why? Because the mafia had that much power back in the day. Yeah. Um, you're actually listening to, uh, aren't you listening to the Five Families? Uh, like, uh, I'm, Audible I'm right listening now? to an Audible, the one of the best books on the on the crime, uh, Italian Mafia. Uh, yeah, it's called Five Families by So. It's got like a, a Arab, Arabic name. Hang on, I want to say it because it's really good, you guys. If you want to listen to it, uh, it like uh, it has like all the details on the Italian Mafia. It's called Five Families by uh, Sowin Rab. Solwyn Rap. That's the name of the guy. Bam. It's pretty good. Yeah, she's been uh, listening to that quite a bit, man. Yeah, I also watched The Goodfellas. <laughs> oh, you did? <laughs> yeah. Good movie, right? Yeah, it was yeah. really good. Yeah. It was really good for 1990s. Yeah. Yeah. That was one, one of the best mob movies uh, of all time. But so. it's about the life of Henry, Henry something. So it was like, he was not like a, he was not a wise guy. Yeah. He was yeah. an associate. Yeah. And then you saw the part where, where uh, they, they've walked them into the room and it was empty. And they yeah, shot him in the back, Joe yeah. Pesci. Yeah. That's when you know that they got you. And it would often be your best friend that they'd walk you in with. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, all right. Let's get back well, in. Well, Michael Francesi talks about that in an interview, yes. by the way. Yes. 
Not long after he left prison, Giganti learned of a police investigation over his association with known mobsters. In 1969, he was indicted for attempting to bribe New Jersey police officers. Allegedly, he offered them money in exchange for information about surveillance and ongoing investigations in the Genovese family. Now at almost 40 years old, he returned to his mental disability as a foil and checked himself into a psychiatric hospital for the first time. To support his story, Giganti and his relatives began to revise his medical history. While Giganti was at Lewisburg, his mother had been required to fill out a detailed family history. She said Vincent was a healthy, happy child. She noted only a speech impediment and a slight heart murmur. He had been a boxer, but never had a serious injury. By the time of the 1969 indictment, however, Giganti's lawyers claimed he was not competent to stand trial. His family suddenly remembered a host of mental problems. He had been given to severe temper tantrums. He had a phobia for the dark. He had been truant from school. He was at one time obese and had learning problems. The incompetency argument worked. Giganti never stood trial for the 1969 bribery charges. Wow. That same year, Giganti... Very smart. You can see here that he built up kind of a fake um, background, a fake, uh, I guess, mental portfolio that he was crazy and he can't stand trial. So what do they do? Ah, uh, you know what, man, he's just a weirdo. His boss, Vito Genovese, died of heart failure while serving a prison sentence for narcotics trafficking. In the decade that followed, the Genovese family was so secretive that for law enforcement, it was difficult to tell exactly who the boss was. Even had the FBI been able to identify the Genovese family leadership, making a case against them was another story. Witnesses were hard to come by. Mobsters who violated the sacred oath faced certain death. The best the FBI could do was to go after individual crimes. There were no laws that focused on bringing down the entire criminal family. Rico. As Gigante that is until Rico came. Yeah. He was moving up in the family. The federal government was about to make the FBI's job a little easier. In 1970, Congress passed the Racketeer Influences and Corrupt Organization Act. But and you guys don't understand how influential this was toward targeting organized crime throughout the United States. This wasn't just used on the mafia, guys. This was later used for against terrorists. It was used against um, like the Hezbollah case, which I talked about, which was the first successful prosecution of a terrorist organization in the United States for material support. I covered that episode as well on this pod. Um, you can really see interesting how episode. It is. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the investigations um, and everything. Motorcycle gangs. Uh, yeah. You really enjoyed that one, right? Yeah. yeah. It was really good yeah. because you you can you guys can see like from people outside. Let me show you guys that one. That one should have got more views, man. That actually was one know. of my favorite episodes <laughs> that I did. Let me. Let it's me show really you good because from people outside the law enforcement, like laws and things, like me, for example, that I don't know anything about American law, you can see how um, the Rico law works. You know, like it go how it goes from the beginning of everything is pretty crazy. Dude, we've done so many episodes. Look at look at all these. Um, so yeah, I mean, um, so you got obviously Courtney Clenny die. Um, where is he? I think he was live. No, was it alive? No, no, no. It was a Thursday episode. Let's see here. Where is it? No, no. Hmm. No, am I going way back? It. Yeah, where is I it? I think it's a live one. No, no, I know it wasn't live because we we definitely pre-recorded it. No, it's after it's after Corny. Yeah, Courtney it was. Clooney. Let me. I'll find it. I'll pull it up for you. I'll go back to this. Do this on the side. All right, we'll carry on. You probably missed it and didn't put it on the on the playlist. Maybe, yeah, <laughs> my maybe. As the Rico laws. What the racketeering law allowed us to do was to look at the family as a criminal enterprise and to attack the family as a criminal uh, act. Yeah. Uh, that became much more effective you, if you look back from the mid-70s to the 80s in terms of actually indicting the entire family and the entire hierarchy of that family. 
The RICO laws require that the government prove that mafia families are essentially criminal enterprises. They must show that the crimes committed by the boss and members of his family. Here's the video, guys, uh, right here. It's, um, if you go back to it, um, first Arizona prosecution in the U.S. operation, um, smokescreen, Hezbollah takedown. This one was really interesting. Um, and yeah, guys, I really enjoyed doing this one. And I think you guys will really enjoy watching it if you get the chance. But it was the first successful prosecution of, uh, for material support in the United States back in the 90s. Really good video. Uh, yeah, the and they talk about the cigarette thing. smuggling in, in this. This is a case that would actually successfully prosecute these guys for cigarette smuggling. So, yeah, if you guys uh, are bored and want to check this out, and I got to check this, check this out. I don't think it's in the right playlist. So, and if you're not bored too, check it out. It's really good. The yeah. documentary is pretty good. It's from Declassified. Like, com- yes, we well, you know we need to do some more. I mean, we'll probably get back to Declassified after cool. this mafia stuff. We'll, yeah. We'll, we'll, okay, after we do this mafia stuff, guys, we're going to do Golden State Killer. I got that one at the top of the list because everyone's right. been asking for that we one. We should do the Menendez Brothers. We'll do like, that I'm one too. Really I, uh, we, uh, we'll we'll research that one because I haven't heard about the, that one. So I well, guess we'll research that to. one. You do need to. It's crazy. We okay. do, do need to do that one. All yeah. Right, cool. And then the Canadian serial killer, Pinkerton or whatever, they ask about him a lot Pinkerton. too. Mm-hmm. Committed to either expand the criminal enterprise or to increase yeah. a family member's position within that enterprise. To successfully bring down a family. The government has to prove that any one of several criminal acts, ranging from racketeering and extortion to murder. Okay, I know why. I dropped it on a Sunday when I wasn't in town. That's why. Even though it was a pre-recorded video. That's why I just put it on the Thursday playlist too. My bad, guys. Has been committed. By 1979, now armed with federal legislation aimed directly at organized crime the FBI had devoted teams to exclusively focus investigations on the five major families. The FBI's Genovese squad finally learned that Vincent Giganti was on a fast track with the family. FYI, guys, when the FBI was at the height of going after the mafia in the late 70s, uh, 80s, they had one squad working on each family. What that basically means is, guys, an FBI squad is a team of agents, okay? It's what we would call, when I worked at HSI, a group. So you have a supervisory special agent, right? I'll break it down for y'all how the FBI does it, and I'll break it down for you guys how HSI does it. But it's literally uh, the same exact thing, just with different terms. So you have a supervisory special agent who is a GS-14, okay? He supervises that group. He's not doesn't carry cases. He's not a case agent. He just supervises. He's basically the middleman between upper management and his agents that are on the ground. Then under him, he has somewhere between seven to 10 guys that are agents, task force officers, et cetera, that work underneath him that um, basically, you know, they submit the reports to him. He signs them, gives it back. Uh, he approves them. He approves paperwork that needs to go up and down the chain. If, uh, you know, someone wants to put in for leave or someone wants to go uh, take a trip or needs funding for a case, whatever. The supervisor, right, is the conduit between you and upper management. Now, I'll give you a little tip right here. The difference between a good supervisor and a bad supervisor, okay, well, before I get into that, HSI, how they do it is, it's called a group supervisor, and then underneath him is every special agent, right? So we don't call it supervisory special agent or SSA like the FBI does, but it's the same exact thing. A group supervisor is a GS-14, just like the FBI SSA is a 14. And then you got special agents underneath him, and the SSA has special agents underneath him. It's just semantics at that point. But the difference between a good supervisor, guys, and a bad supervisor is a good supervisor works for his agents. A bad supervisor's make a bad supervisor makes his agents work for him. I'll give you guys an example of what I mean by this. Um, so a good supervisor, for example, let's say you got a big case. For example, I had a big drug case back in the day and I was doing Title Threes, I was doing all this shit. A good supervisor will literally go to the assistant special agent in charge's office, the SAC, whatever, and fight for your case and say, we need funding. This is what we're doing. I need $50,000 for this wiretap. I need uh, more agents from other groups to help out. He is basically making sure that you as the case agent Get what you need to run your investigation properly and have the resources. Doing complex cases, guys, is very difficult and it requires a lot of manpower. You need someone to back you from management that can get you the funding and support that you need. Because as the case agent, your job is to direct the case, get the reports ready for the AUSA, direct the guys on the ground, put them where you need them to be for surveillance. Um, You're debriefing informants. You're getting funding. You're doing all this stuff. You're writing up memos, whatever. So a good supervisor will help you do all that stuff. Hell. Good supervisors will help you write up your memorandums for funding, 
Okay. Now, here's a bad supervisor. A bad supervisor will sit there and nickel and dime on everything as far as like, hey, you came in late. Hey, what's going on? Where were you? What are you doing right now? Blah, blah, blah. Asking you where you're at all the time. Well, that's also, they do that if the agent isn't doing shit, right? When I was an agent, no one ever asked me where I was because they always knew I was fucking working, right? I'd be up at two o'clock in the morning, typing on my laptop, whatever, uploading reports. So no one ever bothered me about where I was, right? I'd come into the office at two, three in the afternoon sometimes, but I was always working and I always could, I was always writing reports. The number one thing to show that you're working as an agent is are you uploading ROIs, which we call them reports of investigation, HSI. Uh, FBI calls them 302s, DEA calls them DEA 6s, but you guys get the point. It's a report of investigation to document you interviewing suspects, talking to informants, uh, doing surveillance, uh, going to, uh, I wouldn't say meeting with AUSAs, that's, that's, that's kind of lame, but getting an indictment, getting a conviction, uh, you know, interviewing witnesses, all that shit is there. You just document everything, phone analysis, all that crap, right? So a bad supervisor is going to give you a pain in the ass and make your job harder to get shit done or give you a bunch of red tape, right? I remember I had a one really good supervisor. I would literally go into the office and I say, yo, this is what I'm trying to do. Like, what can we do? Instead of him saying no, he would find a way to say, yes, let's make this shit happen because he believed in me and believed in the case I was doing. We did some great cases. But that is the difference, guys, between a good supervisor and a bad supervisor. A good supervisor works for his agents. A bad supervisor where the agents work for him and he works against his agents. Hope y'all enjoyed that, man. Y'all ain't going to get a breakdown like that anywhere else Down on the, the internet. Monko, and the monko, reason why is because there's no one else on the internet that's done criminal cases at a federal level that has a YouTube channel. There's no one. I've seen people kind of yap or whatever, but they, they haven't really done cases. Special Agent Richard Rudolph had been assigned to investigate the Genovese crime family. Through uh, informants and other law enforcement agencies were exchanging information. We became... So, great. This guy that you guys are listening to talk, this is why I love this documentary so much. This guy is more than likely probably the case agent on the Genovese crime family, which means he had the squad working with him, helping him out, and he was the main guy or the point man in the investigation, you know, filling in the AUSA's office, controlling the informants, etc. I'm aware that uh, Mr. Giganti was a, uh, an individual uh, which, with much respect in the Genovese crime family, and operated out of an area in Lower Manhattan. Um, because he was a, uh, an up-and-coming person uh, with a lot of respect within the family, we began to do some surveillances of Mr. Giganti. With the FBI continuing to build its arsenal against organized crime, Giganti's cat and mouse game intensified. He stepped up his public show of mental disorder. In the late 70s and into the 80s, he was admitted five more times for psychiatric treatment. The FBI continued to keep tabs on Giganti. Agents learned that he frequented the Triangle Social Club, a gathering place for Genovese crime figures. He could be found there almost on a daily basis. He lived in the, in the neighborhood. Um, he was in a And this is something very common, guys, with a lot of these organized uh, crime guys in the mafia. They all had certain spots that they would be at where they felt safe and they can talk. Why? Because obviously, when you're a boss, you got a target on your head. An individual that could be found there um, in the uh, late afternoons and into the early hours of the morning. And people would come to see him as opposed to uh, him going to see other people. Though Giganti's association in the Genovese family seemed certain to investigators, Giganti's family and doctors continuously told investigators that he led a very narrow existence. They said his whole world was confined to the block where he lived and the church he attended with his mother. He was barely functional at home and could not care for himself, they said. But with every passing day, the FBI and New York police were seeing a very different... Look at that. They got pictures of him meeting with guys on the street. Looks pretty competent to me, doesn't it? And Vincent Giganti. In the early 1980s, the mafia in the Northeast went through a particularly tumultuous time with several killings. Internal disputes within the family resulted in a string of assassinations. The FBI suspected Giganti was responsible for these gangland executions, especially those intended as punishment for breaking Cosa Nostra rules. Giganti was known to be a traditionalist. He wanted the rules obeyed, and when they were broken, retribution was sure to follow. In 
It started with the murder of Philadelphia crime boss, Angelo Bruno. Although Bruno's family was well outside New York, all families answered to the members of the commission. Giganti was upset because Bruno had been assassinated by his own men in a grab for control of the family. A Cosa Nostra rule had been violated. No one can kill a boss unless the commission sanctions it, and they seldom do. It was rumored for obvious reasons, because as soon as a boss dies, guys, what ends up happening is there becomes a tug of war and a battle for that spot. And it creates a lot of volatil volatility, violence occurs. And guess what happens when violence occurs? Next thing you know, now them boys are on you. FBI, open up! And it brings a lot more attention. And the mafia wants to be in the shadows, right? They, you know, the code of silence or murder. They don't want anyone to see what the fuck they're doing. They want to be able to collect their money through their extortion rackets, their criminal rackets, whatever it is, illegal gambling, loan sharking, whatever it is. They want to be able to do that in silence without the police being involved. And it's very difficult for them to operate when violence is going on and the police have heat on them. There's nothing that will draw an investigation to your door faster than violence. And Lucky, Lucky Luciano knew this, which is why he made sure as soon as the Casamilaris war was over, okay, he made sure to say, all right, guys, it's going to be peace between us. We're just going to make money. No more wars. We're going to have a commission. So no one actually has all the power. The power is evenly distributed amongst the families. You know, it's actually one of the smartest things he can do, which was a high IQ 3D chess move, because he knew if he tried to make himself the boss of all bosses, like with a guy before him, he would have a target on his back. And next thing you know, bam, forget about it. Gone. They so were, he was like, I don't want that bullshit. I want to make money. They were very, very uh, delicate with dealing with the police. They had like rules. Uh, of like in the code that they had is like no dealing with anything like related to the police or anything. So that's why you heard that on that on the audible thing. Yeah. Can you give us like a, one or two examples, like as far as like not? Well, for example, what you just mentioned earlier. Oh, violence. Uh, no, no, no. That they were like uh very um, I don't know how to say this, but like it, yeah, it's kind of like delicate. It, they had like a delicate matter with like narcotics, especially drugs. Because uh, and also like other uh, criminal activities, uh, because they were like high, they will make very, very high uh, federal charges. So oh okay, so, so being yes, yeah, trafficking drugs brought a lot of time with them, and yeah, it was considered so, a dirty business, and and a lot of snitches too. So yeah, they were very, like very respectful of those charges because okay. they will like make like very high federal charges on them. Yeah. So that's why they wouldn't like messing up with the police. Also, like killing police people, uh, like, that kind of shooting things. at police and shit. Yeah, yeah, okay. and not nothing related with the police. They didn't want anything related with the police. Okay, yeah. Well, that makes sense because they were notorious for paying them off. You know what I mean? Versus yeah. like shooting at them or anything else like that. Because yeah, that's gonna you kill a cop, it's over. You're gonna basically you're you're asking for them to come after you yeah, with every that, resource they, they, they got. have codes and like stuff that's they have a load of codes so whenever they will talk in the streets or whatever they wouldn't like be framed for it They'll you know what framed oh framed yes they use different yes yes they definitely use terminology and you're going to see here when they refer to gigante gigante had a very interesting way to have the people yeah. refer to him so they wouldn't mention the, his name. the word mafia was prohibited ah uh, they yes. cannot say mafia whatever because that, that for would, obvious you know, reasons frame it. yeah yeah okay uh, let's get back to the documentary. Rumored that Giganti himself launched an investigation into Bruno's murder. Retribution was swift. Less than a month later, Tony Bananas Caponegro, identified as one of Bruno's assassins, was found dead. He had been shot 15 times and stabbed in the back. His body was stuffed in a trunk and $20 bills were littered around his body. A clear message that he was killed for his greed. And this would happen often, guys, where if they whacked the guy that did some BS, they'd leave things on him as kind of a um, message a message and a warning sign to other would-be um, perpetrators not to do this or else this will be your fate. This is how Godfellas start. Yes. <laughs> On the same day, another body was discovered. This time it was Fred Salerno, dead of gunshot wounds, dumped in a vacant lot. He too had allegedly participated in Bruno's murder.
Phil Testa had taken Angelo Bruno's place as boss. His reign was short. Almost a year after Bruno's execution, Testa was blown up entering his own home. Oh, that's ballsy. Blowing dudes. Man, Mafia didn't give a fuck back then, guys. They're out yeah. here literally blowing dudes up and shit. Man, they would never do that today in post 9-11 era. Wow. Another boss killed without the blessing of the commission. Another avenging act would follow. Rocco Marinucci was next, found dead with fireworks stuffed in his mouth. A gesture designed to show that he was killed for the way in which he had killed Testa. If the Cosa Nostra was to flourish, all of its members had to comply with its rules. There were no exceptions. Giganti was believed to have ordered the murder of one of his own crime family members. Genovese soldier Jerry Papa had murdered two Colombo family members without permission. As punishment for his unsanctioned act, he was brutal. And again, you guys are wondering, why would you kill someone in your own family for killing someone from another family? Well, guys, if you kill someone from another family and it was unsanctioned, mm -hmm. the commission is going to come down on your entire family. So they need to discipline the person from their family because if you fuck with someone from another family, last thing the mafia and the commission wants in general is an all-out war. So yeah. they got to deal with everything in-house. They need to they to have permission yes. to kill anybody. Yep. yep. That was the code back then. Let alone another person, to, another another person family. From, from another part family. Exactly. Yeah. So that's going to cause a bunch of problems for everyone involved. And last thing they want is a turf war or some kind of violence. And at this point, keep in mind, guys, they know that the FBI is breathing down their neck and watching them shot and killed by members of his own criminal family. Had Giganti become the enforcer? Remember, guys, what we said in Goodfellas, they, when they walk you into an empty room to kill you, it's typically your best friends that are with you. Mm -hmm. For the Northeast Casa Nostra, informers within the mob told federal agents that all of these killings had been ordered by Giganti. But information given by admitted criminals is always a problem for potential juries. Criminals will say anything if their cooperation can be traded for a reduced prison sentence. The FBI needed more than the words of criminals looking for a deal. Giganti knew this, and he protected himself accordingly. Yes, guys. So um, co-conspirator testimony is almost never enough. You need other evidence that corroborates it. So, for example, let's say I talk to a cooperator and he says, Yo, such and such is selling drugs. And I'm like, okay, well, how about you go ahead and go buy drugs from that individual? Okay, he goes and buys the drugs. Now, everything he says concerning this potential person selling drugs is way more credible. Why? Because we were able to independently corroborate his information that the other individual is, in fact, a drug dealer through our own independent investigation, which is very important because you can't rely on a crook's testimony to put someone else in jail. You can use it in tandem with other pieces of evidence that stand by themselves, but um, crook testimony in itself a lot of the times isn't enough. You need other pieces of evidence as well, especially in the federal court system. It seemed that Giganti was now the boss. The FBI began a more focused surveillance effort on Giganti. They learned that the Genovese family had also infiltrated several of New York's major industries, the garment trade trucking, garbage collection, airport cargo handling, and the city's seafood industry. Vincent Giganti was known on the streets as the Chin, an abbreviation of Chinzino, Little Vincent. Fearing FBI surveillance and wiretaps, family members were not allowed to speak his name. They were to refer to him with hand signals, touching their chins to communicate his nickname. Bringing down that's how you know on edge these guys were man down the chin was going to take every bit of know-how that the FBI could muster they were going to have to create their own luck as a surveillance team member watched one day a telling crack in the chin's ruse appeared the seemingly frail man was being helped across a busy street 
When oncoming traffic threatened, he became suddenly animated, racing to safety. <laughs> That's it, bitch! <laughs> His helplessness somehow overtook him again on the other side. <laughs> That's huge. Clearly, there were two gigantes, the mentally troubled one displayed to the public and the determined boss of the Genovese administration. The F I got to give it to him. This is dedication, though. The man was Hannah Montana. <laughs> yeah, you can't, you can't find it. I don't know any other crooks that went to this extent to show that they're crazy, bro. The I would soon learn of a third. I think we just did the episode on uh, Marjorie Armstrong from the pizza thing. Yeah. I think this guy got her beat big time. Of course. She's over here just shaving her eyebrows and telling inmates she's crazy and shit and lying. This dude was out here legit walking for hours a day, you know, shaking and shit. <laughs> Giganti's ex-wife and their five children lived in New Jersey while he maintained a relationship with his long-standing companion, Olympia Esposito. He usually called on her late at night, looking quite dapper before he was aware of the surveillance. We learned that uh, he frequently uh, visited a uh, townhouse which was located up on 77th Street and the east side of Manhattan where uh, we later learned that um, a common law, uh, he was living with his common law wife and he had been married previously and this was his second family or this residence. Soon the FBI knew all of the Chin's hangouts. This gave surveillance teams an opportunity to observe Giganti without his knowledge. A major break came when NYPD organized crime task force member, Detective Tom Bruno, was able to snap photos of some of Giganti's activities. All right, real quick, so you guys understand, because you guys are probably wondering, why is the NYPD guy, what's going on here? So in a lot of major cities, um, and, and just in general with any field office, you're going to have something called task force officers. And task force officers, a lot of times, guys, are guys that work under the auspice of a federal agency and get the, um, the authorities and power that that fe federal agency has while simultaneously being able to maintain their state credentials and authorities as well. So basically, they're able to do both things. They could pull somebody over in one situation, but then go ahead and arrest someone federally on another. So they actually have more power if you're going to look at it from um, an investigative standpoint than a federal agent. So these guys are literally critical to organized crime task forces because they can wear many hats. You, they can, you know, let's say you need someone that has a canine, whatever, they can make the call to local PD that has all these resources because federal agents, 99% of the time, don't have access to dogs, don't have access to helicopters and planes and all this other stuff like the state does, DMV records, all that stuff. It all comes from the state, guys. So, you know, this all this mumbo jumper on the movie was like, oh, the feds are coming in and taking over the case. That's a load of fucking bullshit, man. Stop the cap. Right? Does it happen sometimes? Yeah. But in general, most of the time, I'd argue probably 80 to 90% of the time that feds work with state um, officers, they, uh, they need them a lot. And they respect the authority that they bring and expertise they bring to the table. And you guys are going to see here with this guy how he was so valuable. In 1984, I was assigned to a joint organized crime task force. That task force consisted of FBI agents and New York City police uh, officers, detectives. And uh, we were uh, assigned to investigate the Genovese crime family. Then the uh, next step was to go to Sullivan Street where Chin Giganti lived. His apartment was above a pet store, alleged pet store. And he also had a social club on the block. And when you'd go by the social club, you'd see numerous people that were in the photos. And you'd see them standing in front of, going inside, and then sometimes crossing the street, going to uh, the pet store, which was where the Chin, we believe, met people. Uh, pet store really never had any kind of uh, business that we could see. It had a little cat box in the window, and basically that was it. <laughs> Pet store making no business was still open. Hmm, I wonder what's going on there. More and more, Giganti was seen acting normally when he was unaware he was being watched. I see uh, Chin Giganti and I see Andrew Giganti, which is his son, come out of uh, his residence. 
and I'm just minding my business, walking up the block. Uh, Andrew leaves to get in his car, and Chin is standing on the corner, and he wasn't helped out of his building, and he was standing on the corner. Andrew gets in his car, pulls out. As he pulls out, there's a car coming up Sullivan Street. It blows the horn. Uh, Chin Giganti yells, hey, what are you, in a rush? As he does this, I come into the lighted area. He looks, sees me, and all of a sudden his head goes down, and he plays uh, <laughs> the sick point. Oh, of course. Gotcha, bitch! Another break followed Detective Bruno's surveillance successes. The FBI managed to rent an apartment close to the townhouse of Giganti's companion, Ms. Esposito. An agent would exit through a back door in the rented apartment building and position himself about 50 feet from Ms. Esposito's townhouse. From there, Ms. Esposito and Giganti could be seen from time to time. An agent watched the couple for four months between midnight and 2 a.m. Assistant U.S. Attorney Andrew Weissman, who later would have to prove Giganti's competency to stand trial, was delighted with the agent's observations. And lo and behold, when he was inside in a place where he didn't think he was being observed, he did all of the normal things that any of us would do. A matter of fact, what was unusual about those surveillances was that there was nothing unusual about him. He was normal. And guys, that's going to be critical information for them to show that he is competent to face criminal charges. And the person speaking right now is the prosecutor, a.k.a. the assistant United States attorney. That is the equivalent to an ADA or assistant district attorney. <clears throat> he was talking to people. He was counting money. Uh, he never wore a shoddy bathrobe. Indeed, the only time he was seen in a bathrobe was not surprisingly, when he got out of the shower, he would wear a nice, fluffy, Brooks Brothers type bathrobe, which was not at all like the bathrobe that he would wear when he was on the street. So it became pretty obvious to the people conducting the surveillance that he was um, engaging in a concerted effort to give an appearance to the public that was um, false, that was not the way he behaved in real life. Investigators continued to watch Giganti's bizarre public behavior. But photos themselves are only a single link in proving criminal activity. Investigators needed hard evidence to corroborate what the photos were suggesting. That Giganti was in fact the boss. One wiretap conversation between Genovese crew members gave investigators more proof of Giganti's position in the family. On the tapes, known Genovese members were complaining about the chin. Assistant U.S. Attorney George Stambolidis reviewed these tapes to help prepare a case against Giganti. He's constantly nitpicking his men, trying to always, with a million questions, drilling them and questioning them on what they're involved in. He's always looking to get money from them or, or money from some of the schemes and how he earned. Um, and how much money he would make from the gambling operations at the Triangle Social Club and things like that. While Giganti micromanaged the internal affairs of his family, the tabloids began calling him the odd father. <laughs> That's actually pretty funny. Forget about the it. The odd father. He uh, would check himself in to a hospital once a year for what his colleagues in the mafia sarcastically referred to as tune-ups, so that he would have a paper trail showing that he had some, or, or giving the impression that he had some. That goes to show, guys, how dedicated these guys were, man. The, literally, tune-ups is what they called it. A mental condition. And with the assistance of uh, people around him and people in his family, he was able to cultivate this paper trail, giving the impression to anyone who looked at the cold medical records that here's someone who year in, year out, was being treated for some form of mental illness. Giganti knew how to protect himself, both publicly and privately. Mr. Giganti was uh, very clever in uh, how he conducted business. 
and um, he limited his contacts with uh, with members of the family. Uh, if there were messages or uh, or items to be discussed regarding illegal activities conducted by the Genovese family, there would be messages passed on to people immediately surrounding him. Access to him was very limited. If uh, the other family wanted to meet with him, uh, more than likely they would have to send a message. Giganti avoided the normal sit-downs or more formal meetings held regularly by other family bosses. He would take meetings when businesses demanded his attention. He and his visitors would stroll the sidewalks through the neighborhood, ensuring... John Gotti was also famous for doing this. They call it a walk and talk. Since they knew that the FBI was looking at them and places might be bugged, they would often take improv walks and discuss business that surveillance wiretaps would not pick up any incriminating conversations. The always careful Giganti also suspected Ms. Esposito's phone was tapped, and it was. He never talked business on the phone. He would simply use a payphone or make arrangements to talk elsewhere. The FBI would not be able to use the Chin's own words to make a case against him. Other mobsters were not as smart. Sophisticated bugging operations were allowing the FBI to capture a multitude of other mob business on tape. In early 1985, the Justice Department was bearing down hard on the number of high- Rudy Julian and his gang. High-level organized crime figures. Most were being charged under the RICO Act. Though RICO had been around since the early 70s, it was only now receiving its first real test. Two of Giganti's men had gotten wind that the bosses of the Gambino and Lucchese families would soon be arrested. They wondered if the chin was vulnerable. One commented that if he gets pinched, all those years in the asylum would be for nothing. On February more critical evidence that comes through on wiretaps. On 19th, the arrests of several crime family bosses were made. The next day, Vincent Giganti checked himself into the hospital and stayed a week. He had said, of course, <laughs> of course, he checked himself into the hospital right after all his counterparts were arrested by the FBI. Successfully avoided the indictment against the New York bosses. Among those arrested was Paul Castellano, head of the Gambino crime family who would later be killed by John Gotti um, after being indicted. So, and make sure to go check out that episode on John Gotti and um, the Gambino family Gambino if you guys want to get more insight into that. Prosecutors never brought him to trial. He was killed before they had the chance. By Casa Nostra standards, the unsanctioned murders of Gambino boss Paul Castellano and his underboss Tommy Bellotti were unpardonable. And everybody knows John Gotti did it. Although John Gotti, a captain in the Gambino family, acted shocked. There he is with Sammy the Bull. Shocked at Castellano. Which I'll work on getting him on the show for y'all as well. I know he has a YouTube as well. So yeah, we'll did. make we'll make that happen for you guys. Death. It was widely believed that he was responsible. Within two weeks of the murders, Gotti had publicly taken over as boss. Vincent Giganti issued a subtle warning to Gotti. Without mentioning names, he told Gotti that the murderer would have to pay. It took two years, but in 1987, Giganti acted to avenge the murder of his friend and partner in mob business. Through his counselor, Bobby Manna, and some Lucchese family members, Giganti plotted to have Gotti killed. The planning session at a New Jersey restaurant was bugged. And because it was, the FBI saved John Gotti's life. Mm. And I think we actually made a mention of this in the last episode as well, where they got wind of this and they just had to make an arrest immediately and kind of put their case against John Gotti on hold. Because here's the thing, guys, if you're doing wiretaps and you get information that someone's life is in imminent danger, you must act, right? Of course, you don't have to disclose how you know or why you're acting, right? You could just make it look like, hey, we're arresting you on this bullshit charge or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But Behind the scenes, you know you really arrested him because you got a threat on his life. So you have to act when something like that happens.
which I mean, nowadays you have to notify that there was a threat in their life. But I don't know if back then you had to notify them there was a threat in their life. I think all you had to do was just get them out of the situation. And let's say they make bond or whatever. Then at that point, you probably got to disclose it. If agents intercept information of a murder plot, they are required by law to try to prevent the killing. So Bam. How'd I know? Bro. I'm get <laughs> I haven't seen this episode in years, but I already know, guys, why? Because I actually did wiretaps when I was an agent. So I, this is all, you know, second nature for me, man. Based on the tape, agents warned Gotti. Acting on the FBI warning, John Gotti changed his plans on the day the murder was. Okay, so they didn't have enough to arrest him. So what they had to do was notify him. Now, if they did have something to actually grab him on, they would have grabbed him on that, right? Some Typically some bullshit charge and not have to disclose it. But since they didn't have anything, or it would jeopardize their investigation to a degree, they decided to notify him instead. ...to take place. Because he was not where he was expected, the murder plot failed. Giganti, however, did not give up. He asked Vic Amuso, acting boss of the Lucchese family, to supervise another hit. It was up to Amuso and his men to work out the details. doesn't go on? And, and that was to have Amuso reach out to Al Diorco, one of his trusted men, just as Mana was one of Giganti's trusted men, and have Diorco use his contacts uh, in other parts of the country to acquire a remote-controlled bomb. But Gotti was arrested and imprisoned before the second plot could be carried out. He died of cancer while serving a life sentence for racketeering involving extortion and murder including Castellanos. Meanwhile, the FBI had Chin's men on tape conspiring the murder. As the FBI's investigation into Genovese family operations continued, information about a corrupt construction scheme was coming to light. They learned that for years, much of the Genovese family income came from one segment of the construction industry, the window business. The family had managed to keep its hold on window replacement jobs for all of New York City's public housing projects. We learned big money maker, and this is another example of the mafia getting in to legitimate businesses and labor unions to get a cut. I just find it crazy that they're all business like small businesses. Yeah, you know. Well, the mafia was smart. They knew, like, and this is why they prioritize gambling. You know, loan sharking. Like at face value, these crimes are bullshit, right? Like, yeah, if you get charged with lo loan sharking or I mean, extortion probably has the most time, but they weren't like beating people down every day. Yeah. But gambling, cigarettes, smuggling, this type of shit, if you get caught for it, you're not going to really, you know, do that much time, which is what the mafia love because they were lucrative while simultaneously also being low risk, unlike drugs or murder, etc. The mafia typically only murdered when they needed to, to prove a point. But other than that, they weren't, weren't running around just killing random civilians. It was typically for power with some kind of purpose yeah. within the organization. At that time, there was a, uh, an enormous amount of money being put into uh, refurbishing some of the New York City Housing Authority windows. Uh, there was a, an energy crisis underway, and the timing of this was ideal for the um, organized crime people to become more active in it. What we learned was that uh, the Genovese family, uh, along with uh, two or three other families, were becoming involved in companies that were bidding and installing the windows in some of these housing projects. From the uh, late 1970s up until the late 1980s, uh, there was approximately $190 million worth of contracts given out by the city of New York for the window replacement industry. It was classic mob business and a textbook example of racketeering. The mafia took over an industry to the exclusion of legitimate businesses. Union officials were corrupted. In this case, Iron Workers Local 580. Bids were rigged, and companies or workers trying to play by the rules lost out. For years, the Lucchese and Genovese families operated their construction schemes. Really smart scheme, man. Really, really smart. Autonomously. By the early 80s, they realized that a partnership would be much more profitable. By this time, the Lucchese family had a firm hold on Local 580, and the Genovese family had corrupted several contractors. They cooperated because it meant more business. By using the Local 580 as a tool, 
they were able to exclude several um, contractors from coming in and bidding on some of these projects and in essence created a uh, somewhat of a monopoly for themselves. On nearly all city housing authority work and on much of the new construction for the city, the Genovese contractors and installers paid $2 a window. A dollar went to the Lucchese family, 25 cents to the collector and 75 cents to the boss for the family's role in handling the union. The other dollar went to the crooked union officials who looked the other way as jobs went to non-union workers. Refusal to cooperate often carried a penalty of violence. In the late 80s, a carpenter's union delegate had both of his legs broken by Genovese men for refusing to cooperate, though he maintained that he was unable to get a good look at his attackers. And in 1992, a delegate from Local 580 was shot and killed coming out of his house on Long Island over a disagreement with his Casa Nostra contracts. The Lucchese and Genovese family arrangement was working very smoothly. That is, until Peter Savino was persuaded to wear a wire. Savino was a Genovese soldier and point man for the window racket. We built a case on him, a murder case on him, and it was sufficiently compelling that he realized, like many of these people, that he didn't want to die in jail. So what did he do? He, he decided to cooperate and for an 18-month period made tape recordings of people in the Genovese family and people in the Lucchese family operating this scheme. Oh, man. <laughs> Shit's about to get real now. Vincent Giganti didn't realize Peter Savino was turning on him. He was happy with Savino's work and satisfied with the window scheme's progression. And guys, you typically don't suspect the guys that are earning the, the most money for you. So this guy was under the perfect guise to be in a situation to assist the government. Savino kept track of the money. He managed the contracts. He supervised the bids. He arranged the payoffs. The boss was happy, but some Genovese family members began to suspect Savino. When bodies were found in the basement of a building he owned, Genovese members were surprised that he was never seriously investigated by law enforcement. Hmm, got some, you know, alarm bells going off right now. As a result of that, People speculated, well, Savino wasn't arrested, yet these bodies were found in a building that's tied to him. Maybe he's cooperating, but nobody was really sure. Savino was a cash cow for Vincent Gigatti. He was bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars for the Genovese family every month. So when Gig I don't want to say I'm right again, but pretty much proves my point <laughs> from before. Gigatti was told of... I haven't seen this episode in years, by the way, guys, just so y'all know, so... Again, this just comes from doing these podcasts and knowing how the mafia moves. Savino's betrayal. He chose not to believe it and initially refused to order him killed. Savino continued to wear the wire, trying to get other family members to acknowledge Chin and his position as boss of the family. Giganti's troops, however, could never be persuaded to break the boss's rule about not mentioning his name. Remember Unisil. Vincent had said when it came time to bid, oh, okay, I'll mention the work. Uh, he, he had said to go out and bid the work. It was, don't mention that name. How can you talk like that? That was pretty damning proof, um, even though it didn't, yep. gotcha, bitch. didn't give you a specific crime. It told you that this was a man to be feared. It was hardly somebody who was incompetent. Shortly thereafter, it came to Giganti's attention that Savino was, in fact, cooperating. Furious at this betrayal, Giganti ordered the murder of Peter Savino. By that time, the FBI had relocated Savino well out of Genovese family reach, but not before he supplied agents with thousands of hours of taped conversations. 
Mr. Savino was also um, in a position to provide us with the historical aspects of how the scheme developed, his relationship with uh, the leaders of both the Lucchese and Genovese crime family, and what their participation was in this thing. Mr. Savino also was able to uh, tell us how the various members of all of these families interacted with uh, Local 580, which was used, again, as the tool to make the scheme work. The FBI was successfully employing the RICO laws to bring down New York's most powerful bosses. As a result, high-ranking family members saw that their only way to avoid long prison terms was to cooperate. Among them were Gambino family underboss Salvador Sammy the Bull Gravano. Giganti was finally arrested and charged under the RICO laws with ordering six people murdered conspiring to kill three others and at least 24 counts of racketeering. Oh, shit, man. Oh, shit! Oh, shit! In short, Giganti was charged with being the boss of the Genovese crime family. But Giganti still had his mental illness history to fall... Walks out in that robe looking all crazy. ...all back on. Mr. Giganti was indicted in, in May of 1990 and the second indictment was filed against him in June of 1993. Mr. The case against Mr. Giganti was unusual that it spanned uh, several years before it actually went to trial. Uh, he eventually went to trial in June of 1997. During that period of time, the issue was that was before the courts was that uh, whether he was competent to stand trial or not. That issue was finally resolved in, um, in 1996. Seven years after his arrest, a federal district judge declared Vincent Giganti competent to stand trial. Damn, here we go, man. Fatality. All that time trying to prove that you're crazy, and the judge still rules that you're sane enough to stand trial, man, which is the whole purpose why he had that persona. Vincent the Chin Giganti was 69 years old when a jury convicted him of conspiring to kill three mafia figures, including Gotti and Savino. He was also found guilty of extortion and union payoff conspiracies in the window replacement scheme. But jurors failed to convict him on charges of directly ordering six murders. Now that Giganti was convicted, his defense lawyers argued that he was not fit to be sentenced. They claimed he was too old, too frail. Gotta try again, man. And too mentally incompetent to understand the punishment. While awaiting sentencing, Giganti was confined to a prison hospital and examined by several doctors. Giganti was given several PET scans, a procedure that uses a radioactive tracer to measure brain chemistry. A 1991 scan, first read as normal, was later found to be too flawed to use in diagnosis. A 1993 scan did show some abnormalities. But at least one expert, Dr. Jonathan Brody, judged these abnormalities as not consistent with dementia. Dr. Brody is an attending psychiatrist at New York's Bellevue Hospital and a professor at New York University's School of Medicine. He also conducts research on schizophrenia. Mr. Giganti, at the time of the scan, was purportedly taking medication that affects the brain and because it affects the brain, it affects brain chemistry, and brain chemistry is what a PET scan is all about. Giganti was taking an antipsychotic medication, an antidepressants, a low potency tranquilizer, and sleeping pills. So Dr. Brody was skeptical about the PET scan, but had yet to examine the patient. When the three of us entered the, the observation room, the examining room where he was then uh, brought, I, I was struck at first by his appearance, which I said made me think, oh, my God, he really is sick. Uh, that that uh, I've missed the boat. He's really very sick. He came in wearing a bathrobe. He was shuffling. He was mumbling. He was uh, making allusions to God. 
But as the examination progressed, some of Giganti's actions began to raise doubts. But one of the things that really struck me was uh, that I didn't note at the time, but I noted a few seconds later was when I put out my hand for him to shake it, he didn't shake it. And that's a very automatic behavior. You put your, your hand out, your worst enemy can put his hand out to you and you tend to take it. How about this, how about this one? When Giganti was asked the names of his children, he didn't know. When he was asked where he lived, he didn't know. And yet, these are things that people tend not to forget. You know, the brain in a dementia tends to work on the process of accounting. The last in, first out. So recent memory tends to be lost, but that's why people who are very demented can often remember very well events from long ago, even if they can't remember recent events. Well, he was not consistent on that. Indeed, he was asked the question about who the president of the United States was, which is a standard question on a psychiatric mental status evaluation. And he scratched his head and he looked perplexed and he said, um, I should know that. I really, I should know that answer. <laughs> Al acting. It's in there somewhere. He was all about um, faking it. And some more questions. Faking it till you make it, man. Yeah. This is a perfect example of when acting definitely gets you denied. I really should know that. And then finally he said, Bush, George Bush. And I sat there and thought, oh, he remembered the question. What was striking was not that the answer was incorrect. What was striking was that the question was remembered despite all of the interfering questions. Mm. What was the precedent then? He asked a bunch of questions and he remembered one of them mm -hmm. in that exchange, which set it off that this dude isn't crazy like he claimed. He remembered a small detail that should have been over gloss given his condition. Right. With air quotes. And there were other red flags. He seemed to understand abstract concepts. Dr. Brody asked Giganti if he was proud of his children. Now, pride is really quite an abstract notion. And his response was, yes, they're all working. Legitimate jobs. Legitimacy? Well, that wasn't even a question. Legitimate implies yet something else, that he was able to abstract <laughs> from the question, some intent as to what the question was involved with, and awareness of a distinction between legitimacy and illegitimacy. And here was a man who didn't know what month it was. He didn't know if he was in a hospital. Allegedly. Allegedly, of course. These and other inconsistencies contributed to Dr. Brody's conclusion that Giganti did not suffer from progressive dementia, vascular dementia, or schizophrenia. Guards assigned to watch Giganti during his pre-sentencing hospitalization also found his behavior normal. They testified that he was active around his prison hospital cell and polite to the hospital staff. He did not need help to shout, to groom himself, or to feed himself. The lawyers, put more red flags, all put in affidavits that they couldn't communicate with Vincent Giganti at all. Well, when he was in jail, he managed to speak with the prison counselors. When you sort of talk to the sort of low-level people in jail who have to take care of inmates on a day-to-day -day basis, it turns out... He knew exactly that what had happened. He knew he had been on trial. He knew that Gravano had testified against him and didn't have very nice things to say about him. He knew that his sentencing was upcoming. He knew what the issue was before Judge Weinstein as to that he had to decide that he was competent to be sentenced. It was completely at odds with what his lawyers were telling Judge Weinstein. Some psychiatrists thought Giganti really was incompetent. Others thought he was faking. Five months and dozens of tests later, the judge ruled. The judge said, in short, the defendant's cognitive and emotional capacity and his communication skills are equivalent to other 69-year-old defendants with limited education. 
No hallucinations interfere with his abilities to participate in sentencing. Boom. Boom, my God. <laughs> yeah, bro. He understands Boom, the fundamentals of criminal substantive law and procedure. He is deliberately feigning mental illness to avoid punishment, which he fears. Defendant is competent to be sentenced and to serve an appropriate term in prison. There you go. He <laughs> described efforts of the FBI and prosecutors as historic and courageous. This has been a battle that, that certainly I've been involved with for the last 20 years and, and certainly I think agents that will continue that on over the next five or six years. If the effort could be sustained and the resources maintained, you know, I think we're on the verge of really reducing the effects and the impact of the Cosa Nostra. Yep, he definitely was right about that because, you know, 20, 30 years later, now that we're in 2023, the mafia, it's kind of, it's a former shell of itself, man. Do they still exist? Absolutely, but they don't have the same power that they did back in the 70s and 80s. And, well, and of course, the 20s and onward. To be sure, the government's legal victory in the Giganti case was partial. The jury, after all, failed to convict him of the six murder charges. He was originally sentenced to 12 years. In 2003, he pleaded guilty to obstruction of justice and earned three more years, finally admitting in court that he had been faking insanity the entire time. Damn. And that right there, guys, there is go. the Genovese crime family, uh, you know, highlighting the crazy Don, a.k.a. the odd father. <laughs> um gigante that's a well angie joke. what's your uh, final thoughts on this before we close out i think that was a clever man yeah although not that clever because he didn't make it but that's dedication uh, it's crazy yeah if the fbi had not had him on like 24-hour surveillance like that they wouldn't have been able to figure that out so surveillance was mm. really critical in that case and which yeah. led to the wiretaps etc but um guys hope you enjoyed that episode man I'm going to catch you guys on the next one. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Check me out on fitted.1811 uh, to get a hold of Angie if you want to. <clears throat> She's going to be more active on there. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, we'll see her on there. And uh, she'll be watching the lives with you guys or, excuse me, the premieres. So if you have any questions, always hit her up and she'll relay them back to me or cases y'all want to see. Yes. She has a running list. And, uh, yeah, yes. we'll catch y'all. Uh, like the video, by the way. Don't be a fucking ninja watcher. <laughs> Later, guys. <laughs> I was a special agent with Homeland Security Investigations, okay guys?